Welcome to Top of Mind, the show where we talk to real estate industry insiders and experts about the biggest trends impacting the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast from Altos Research. Thanks for joining us. The Top of Mind podcast is where I talk to the smartest leaders, thinkers, and doers in the real estate industry to provide context and perspectives beyond the market data that we put out every week at Altos Research. If you're not familiar with Altos, we track every home for sale in the country, all the pricing and all the supply and demand. We analyze all those changes in that data and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. Uh, People desperately need to know what's going on in housing right now especially as the landscape is changing. So if you're asking, can I get the data from my local market? The answer is yes. Uh, All the data, all the resources, visit altosresearch.com. You can book a free consultation with our team uh, and learn how to use the market data in your business with your clients, with people who need to know right now what's happening. So without further ado, though, let me uh, introduce my guest today, Rick Sharga. Rick is the Executive Vice President of Market Intelligence at Adam, one of the country's leading providers of real estate data for, for real estate, financial services, and insurance companies, government. Over the past 25 years, Rick has uh, held numerous senior leadership positions in, in the real estate and mortgage, mortgage industries, and is one of the most frequently quoted sources on real estate, mortgage, and foreclosure trends. Rick has uh, appeared regularly on CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, NPR, all the other major networks. So nicely done there, Rick. Uh, Rick has also been named twice to the Inman 100, the annual list of the most influential leaders in real estate. So Rick, welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. It's uh, great, great to do this with you, my friend. Uh, you, you and I have known each other for for a long, long time. Compared notes, uh, probably over a few too many glasses of wine. Um, so, so it'll be nice to do this uh, in, a, in a probably more professional environment. But uh, but it'd be great to compare notes with you today. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, so uh, for for listeners who don't know Adam Data, Adam and Realty Track. Why don't you give us a quick overview of that of Adam and the company, and then um, and uh, and also your work with Realty Track? Sure, Adam, as you mentioned, is probably one of the leading providers of real estate related data uh, for people that are looking to to uh, utilize that data as part of their business operations or, or, or market analytics. So we we provide uh, property property characteristic data, transaction data, um, loan information. Uh, environmental risk, climate risk, crime records, uh, demographics, school rankings, just, just about anything you can imagine that's real estate related. Uh, and, and we provide that to, to companies in the real estate, mortgage, financial services, insurance industries, and, and government agencies as well. And we, we actually have products that are also geared toward smaller businesses. Uh, we have a small and medium enterprise group that caters to uh, individuals, uh, smaller businesses, uh, real estate professionals, loan officers, and the like. Um, and so a whole whole range of, of product offerings from big enterprises to individuals. One of our uh, product lines is a website uh, called Realty Track, uh, which actually is what the company started out as back in the, the mid-90s before growing into a data licensing company. And Realty Track publishes the country's largest database of foreclosure information. Uh, it's used primarily by individual investors and real estate professionals who are looking for information uh, on properties in various stages of foreclosure. So uh, that's available at realtytrack.com, no K. Uh, and, uh, and you can find uh, the, the whole Adam uh, data um, offering at our adamdata.com uh, website. That's Adam with two T's, A-T-T-O-M data. Yeah. So thank, thanks for the opportunity to say a little bit about the companies. Yeah, for sure. And and Realty Track was it was quite a story because it was the leading uh provider of the finance uh, the the foreclosure data 15 years ago when the world all of a sudden needed to know everything about the foreclosure market. That's actually how I accidentally got started in this business. I was a I was a technology marketing guy for the first half of my career. 
And uh, one of the companies I started doing a little bit of consulting work for was this little startup called Realty Track that was aggregating foreclosure data across the country and getting ready to expand. And that happened at just the right time because that's when the the foreclosure crisis hit. the 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 great uh, The great recession happened, and you know, candidly, Mike, we were the only company willing to talk about what was going on in in foreclosures. Uh, a lot of the other there were only a handful of companies that had similar data, uh, but most of them really didn't want to be talking about what was happening. It was scary, it was, right? Yeah, it was scary, and and. You know, candidly, some of these companies were from inside the mortgage industry, and the mortgage companies were the ones doing the foreclosing. So it just it it, it was an awkward time for for them to be talking about it. So, so yeah, and and you know, you mentioned how much time I've spent dealing with the media. That's my current role at Adam is to to kind of be our liaison to the media, also go out and speak at industry events and 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 do a little bit of work with with customers and prospects uh, who are looking for market data. And, you know, that that all started by talking about foreclosures and then gradually went into short sales and then traditional sales and then, you know, general real estate and mortgage topics. And, and you and I met back then uh, as well. Uh, when, and, uh, and and for the for those of you who don't know Mike and his company, you know, Mike, Mike is one of the, the has one of the longest tenures of anybody covering the, the parts of the real estate industry that he does. And I've always looked at his data. So it's. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's it, it, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Sometimes there you go. Uh, it's funny how all of a sudden, 17 years later, we are uh, the world's experts in our little niche of uh, mm -hmm. the, the universe. Um, yeah, I sometimes uh, I, I sometimes laugh at myself and think about that. You know, <clears throat> my Altos research started off as, as a personal exercise analyzing one, my you know, overpriced piece of junk, Silicon Valley mortgage, you know, when I was 30 years old and, and you didn't know what was going on. Um, and, uh, and it evolved into, into this, co <laughs> this company and, uh, you know, and now I'm, you know, totally unemployable. So we've got to, you know, got to run out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, um, you know, the, we're in this market, um, in the last two years, two years ago, we, we start when when pandemic lockdown started happening. We all assumed that the market was going to tank, and that uh, that there would be a lot of foreclosures and people wouldn't be able to afford their homes, and you know, we would run into another crisis. That was pretty broadly assumed at that time. Uh, what happened? Well, I, I I I'm I'm smiling a little bit because I was a lone voice crying in the wilderness back then. I, I had the opportunity to do some research on how the housing market had fared through prior pandemics or periods of economic shock like 9-11, mm. which was the closest proxy I could find to a, a situation where everything shut down uh, instantly. Uh, and, and what I learned was kind of encouraging is that the housing market typically fared pretty well through those other periods. And in fact, very often led the rest of the economy in, in, in its recovery. So that, that was one thing we had, at least in my mind, going into the pandemic was that, that the track record of housing going through and, and coming out of pandemics was actually a lot better than people assumed it was. The other things that happened, um, and I'll, I'll try and do the Reader's Digest version here, um, we lost 22 million jobs virtually overnight. Um, to put that in perspective, and, and that that took unemployment up to almost 15% nationally, uh, almost 16% in California. And to put that in perspective, it, during the Great Recession, unemployment peaked at a little bit over 11%. So the, the number of jobs lost and lost all at once was just mind boggling. But unlike most recessions where there's job losses across the board, white collar, blue collar, government, uh, entrepreneurial jobs, everybody loses a job. In this case, a lot of the job losses were focused on a handful of, of, of industries in the service sector, restaurants, retail, travel, tourism, hospitality, entertainment. Uh, and, and what a lot of the workers in those industries have in common is that they're renters, not homeowners. And in a lot of cases, not even close to being homeowners. Um, 
So we had kind of a bifurcated situation going on in the housing market where the, the rental community uh, was was under much more financial duress than, than the owner-occupant community. Um, and so you had what, what some economists referred to as a K-shaped recovery, uh, where, the, where the homeowners and the, the, the better off uh, folks from a financial standpoint recovered much more quickly. So that was one of the reasons housing didn't tank the way a lot of people expected it to. The other, candidly, is the government came in um, in an unprecedented manner to protect homeowners. Uh, we had never seen anything quite like this before, but they initiated a, a foreclosure moratorium that lasted almost two years. Uh, and during that time, virtually the only properties going into foreclosure were commercial properties, um, which weren't protected by the same regulations, uh, and vacant and abandoned properties, which everybody kind of agreed would be a good thing to, to get resolved. And then they put the mortgage forbearance program in place as part of the CARES Act, where all a borrower had to do was let their, their mortgage servicer know they're impacted by COVID and they were allowed to miss mortgage payments. And, and that uh, gave people 18 months of, of not having to make a mortgage payment. Uh, the, as they left, the government's program gave them a repayment plan that the industry had never seen anything like before. You take all of those missed payments and you can tack them onto the end of your loan. So if you've missed a year and a half's worth of payments, Normally in forbearance, you have a lump sum due at the end of that period, which would have put everybody into foreclosure. Um, instead, you have a 30-year loan and you're on year five. Now you don't have to worry about making those payments for another 25 years. So yeah. it, 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 the program has been a remarkable success. Less than 1% of the 8 million people who have entered that program have left via a short sale or a default or a deed in lieu or anything like that. Um, Probably the best example I've seen in my decades in the industry of the government and the mortgage industry working together for a positive effect. So combination of, of the government uh, protection rules, the odd nature of this recession uh, in terms of job losses, and candidly, the, the unbelievably rapid recovery of the economy. Uh, literally, we had a, a recession that lasted one quarter, and then we had a record quarter the following quarter. So a lot of those jobs came back. Uh, unemployment typical unemployment rates typically lead to foreclosure rates. Uh, right now, there's more jobs than there are people looking for work. So it, it's just been a, a remarkable, remarkable period. I'm sorry that was longer than I expected, but that's perfect. That's really great. Well, you know, one of the things that that uh, it brings up though is we have uh, so the so one thing I noted as you're talking is that we actually had the housing market started booming before the government programs went in place. Like people started buying things. So uh, it's, I think it's important to remember that it, it was not just, we didn't have a boom because of the programs. We had the boom and then we added, we had some start of the boom and then we added some of those programs on. So like we noticed three weeks into the lockdown that people were buying homes. Yep. And so, and that was before any, any, you know, things were, no, and, and you were you were the only ones reporting that because I I, I did a webinar with a, a, a rather well known uh, real estate industry analyst. Uh, I, I believe it was in May of that year, and and at that point you knew you knew that people were already buying houses, and he fairly confidently predicted that we'd see home sales crater by forty to fifty percent uh, that year. Um, and what we saw instead was a second half of that year where the numbers were off the charts in terms yeah. of home sales. So yeah. you got an early inkling of that. Most of the industry missed it. Um, and, and actually, his thesis at that point was was logical. Uh, we, we had missed the spring selling season. Um, and, and that's usually the most critical time of the year. But but what most people didn't anticipate was that you know, December would turn out to be a great year for home sales. Who knew that? Yeah. Everybody wanted a new house in their Christmas stocking, so it was uh, it was an unusual unusual year. It's great. It's every once in a while I say you know it's because we are so fast with the uh, Altos data. We can we are uh, off we're often um, we our data turns before the headlines. Yep. And it is fun to be contrarian. And there are sometimes when you are contrarian and bullish at the same time, where the headlines are still really bearish, but the data is bullish. 
Like those are the best times to, to be able to, yeah, to it's, say. It's a lot, it's a lot more fun to do that than to be the contrarian bear. That, that, yes. That's no fun at all. I know. I, I never I, want to talk about it. <laughs> I do want to push back a little bit on something you said. I, I agree with you that the boom started prior to the pandemic. And, and that was driven really by two things. It was driven by demographics. So the average age of a first time home buyer right now is 33. The largest group of millennials, which is the largest generation in history, are between the ages of 29 and 32. So demographically, we saw a ton of households being formed. I think, I think one of the things you'll see coming out of the pandemic is that household for nation, formation numbers are going to be corrected massively because I think they were grossly underreported for logical reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was hard to go count people if you were, you know, quarantine. Um, but but that was already starting and low interest rates and and I think the government actions caused interest rates to go even lower as we got into the pandemic. So those two things were, were driving uh, driving home sales. But the, the thing the pandemic did was accelerate some trends you and I had already noticed were happening. We were already seeing millennials who were renting in urban areas, moving to the suburbs and becoming homeowners. But I think the pandemic, because of health reasons and because of the opportunity to work from home, really accelerated those trends. Uh, and we saw a lot of people moving out of the cities. We saw some people moving into different states um, because of, of cost of living uh, benefits. And and that, I, I believe, was an accelerant to what was an already uh, on fire housing market. Yeah. So that so brings up interest rates. Yep. So <laughs> so let's talk about interest rates. So I got two, two questions. One is, you know, w- we've gone from, from two and a half to five. Uh, and so we'll want to talk about what that means for the, for the rest of the year. But then I also have a question. When I share data, there is a class of, of people who, uh, view the, the active market, the, the, the demand, um, which seemingly unsatiable demand, insatiable demand and the price driving as as artificially inflated or supported by uh, rate policy, the Federal Reserve, um, and so so the the two questions are one is you know first let's just tackle what we think about the you know higher rates now and and what we see happening. Uh, for example, are there foreclosures or things that might happen or like those kinds of trends that we haven't se- that are super low now? Do they start again? Uh, and then and then the other is is you know is is the whole boom fake you know propped up yeah so yeah and i get that a lot i I, for some reason a lot of the people in my linkedin network are conspiracy theorists you know it's 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 all the fed it's it's you know the martians coming in and, and anyway um on on the first one no, I, I think I think we're kind of still suffering from PTSD from from the Great Recession, uh, and and what people have to remember is that during the last housing boom, interest rates on thirty year fixed rate loans were routinely five, six, seven, seven and a half percent. What we did see was a, an inordinate number of adjustable rate loans that weren't good adjustable rate loans. These were loans with teaser rates, which were the only way people could afford to get into a house. So you had a 1% or 2% teaser rate on your loan that in two years went to 4%. Uh, and people weren't really good at basic math. They would say, oh, that's only, that means my, my interest rate's going up 2%. No, no, that means it's going up 200%. Um, and, and that's going to have some implications for, for your payments. Uh, and as long as home prices kept going up, you could theoretically get out of that by selling your house. Um, when prices stopped going up, the whole house of cards fell apart. We don't have that situation this time. In fact, we might have the opposite effect this time. Uh, we've had millions of people refinance or buy uh, with loans that are now at 25 3.25%. They're not going to be terribly inclined to to sell that house uh, and buy a new house that's twenty percent more expensive than it was a year ago, and get a mortgage that's you know two three points higher than the one they already have. So we might suffer from a little bit of rate lock, which will not help 
inventory recover anytime soon. Uh, but but somebody who has a 3% mortgage doesn't care if the new mortgage rates go up to 5% because it's not going to affect that person. In fact, they're now really happy because they're paying below market rates and they're paying way below inflation rates. So so the, the rising interest rates by themselves are not going to cause any kind of foreclosure wave. Um, I am concerned if I'm going to look for an area of vulnerability, it would be, and I'm not picking on this cohort, but probably be the FHA loan portfolio. Uh, FHA, particularly people who have bought more recently. So the characteristics of that, that group are they have lower, they have less equity because they took out a low down payment loan. That's why they got an FHA loan. They typically have lower cash reserves. They typically have a higher debt to income ratio, which means more of their monthly income goes to, to paying down debt. Um, and they're facing a couple issues right now, not the least of which is this persistently high inflation. So if you were somebody who stretched to get into your house and just kind of barely made the, the, the cutoff, uh, and now and, and a higher percentage of your, your, your monthly income was already going for things like food and, and gas and, and heating oil, uh, and now you're looking at those three prices skyrocket. You know, you're in a situation where you're one water heater mishap away from not being able to make your mortgage payment. And, and in a lot of cases, that's all it takes for a borrower who is right on the edge to fall into kind of a vicious cycle uh, where they just can't recover. So I, I am a little bit concerned about that. The, the, there's $27 trillion in homeowner equity out there which is the opposite of where we were the last time uh, during the Great Recession, a third of homeowners uh, were underwater on their loans. Uh, we, had, we, we had lost trillions of dollars of equity during the Great Recession. So even for people who do find themselves in financial distress uh, and can't make their mortgage payments, you know, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, they have enough equity, they can sell their house uh, and, and walk away and get a fresh start. Uh, but those, those, more recent buyers who have little equity to tap into uh, and might find themselves in financial trouble because of other economic conditions, those are the ones I'm a little bit concerned about. In, in terms of where the market goes, which I think was the question that I just ran right past, um, I, I think new buyers are, are looking at a triple whammy right now. You're, you're looking at home prices that have gone up between 17 and 20 percent year over year, depending on where you are in the country. You're looking at interest rates that have effectively doubled on the most popular loan product out there, the 30-year fixed rate loan. And you're looking at inflation that right now is running at 8.5% uh, and may not slow down anytime soon, despite uh, the Fed actions. You know, Just, just combining the, the home price increases and the, the mortgage rates, if you were looking at buying the same house today that you could have bought a year ago, your monthly mortgage payment is going to be somewhere between 25 and 30% more. Uh, and you know, I, I did ask my boss for a thirty percent year, yearly raise. I, I didn't get mine. I, I'm not sure how many people got theirs, um, but that that becomes a real issue. Um, and and uh, and and you know, just things you don't think about. If the Fed does push through Fed funds rate increases as planned, and they're pretty much going to have to to slow down inflation, that's going to push the interest rates on credit cards up. A lot of households have a lot of credit debt, so. Their, their monthly prices for, for paying off their credit cards are, are going to go up as well. So there is a ripple effect. And I do think over time, probably later this year, uh, we will start to see demand noticeably weaken uh, as we get to kind of a, a, an affordability wall where potential buyers just say, that's too much. Um, and, and, you know, you and I look at the same data. Um, We've already seen existing home sales and new home sales down on a year over year basis uh, for, for a number of months. Pending home sales are down. Uh, if you look at year over year pending home sales, they're down for 10 consecutive months. Um, the, the Mortgage Bankers Association's purchase loan index, which shows how many people are applying for mortgages, is now trailing both 2021 and 2019. Uh, I'm throwing out 2020 because right now we were in the teeth of the pandemic. And so that those numbers are all all out of whack, um, and consumer confidence is about the lowest it's been in a decade. 
So you have a lot of factors that you know you look at. I, I talk to realtors and they joke about it. They say, yeah, now we're not getting 30 offers on a house. We're only getting 20. Um, and and there, there is still demand because of the reasons we talked about before in terms of demographics. But um, I do think over the course of the year, we will see demand appreciably weaken. As demand weakens, uh, sales volume will slow down. As sales volume slows down, I, I believe we'll start to see pricing uh, get more rational. So I'm not calling for a market crash, but I, I do think we'll see prices plateau a bit. And and there will pr- probably be some instances where prices will correct. You'll see you'll see price corrections um, in markets like coastal California, the Pacific Northwest, maybe places like Austin or, or Boise where prices were hyperinflated last year. Um, but that's that's what's in my admittedly cloudy crystal ball right now. Yeah, so th- there's a lot there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the uh the so th- the the interesting scenario then is we have what if we have people who are FHA buyers now and uh basic tell me uh, FHA means means uh they can have a a tiny amount down because the Federal Housing uh, Administration agency is guaranteeing that loan yep. to um, and so typically, what what are the dynamics of an H- FHA loan? It's it's very similar to a, a normal a, a conventional loan. The, the, the difference is, it, as you mentioned, it's it's guaranteed by the Federal Housing Administration, a government agency. Um, so if if the loan goes bad, the government basically uh, makes makes whole the the lender. Um, but you can have a loan. You can get an FHA loan for as little as three and a half percent down. Um, the, the borrower typically has less stringent credit requirements, um, less stringent requirements for cash reserves, employment history. So, you know, it, it's not exactly the way it's written up, but, but FHA loans typically are, are, you know, for, for lower income borrowers or first time home buyers. So then, um, so then we could see, for example, if we we're, if, FHA buyers in some of the crazy markets like like Austin or Boise, um, then we have and we have some of that uh, migration driven stuff like California people stop buying in in Boise, um, and we have uh, plateau price decline. Um, we could see a, a segment of buyers that could get in trouble. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it more more historically, Mike. If, if throughout the pandemic for a minute, um, and to a certain extent throughout the Great Recession, um, you can almost always draw a direct line from unemployment rates to delinquency rates to foreclosure rates, and and that that's been pretty true historically. So you start to see unemployment tick up over five percent. Uh, you start to see delinquencies go up. You start to see foreclosures go up. Um, so it all comes down to the underlying economy. What concerns me right now for those, and, and again, could be other types of loans, but let's just stay with FHA borrowers for a minute because they they kind of fit into this profile by and large. Um, even if they don't lose their job, their cost of living is going up disproportionately quickly because of inflation. Uh, and, and it will also go up because of Fed actions. As I mentioned, their their interest on on other loans on, on credit cards, those payments are going to go up. So, if you were you know if 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 you were a borrower where 45 percent of your monthly income was going to housing costs, which is not unusual for an FHA borrower in a, in a high price market, um, now you have less money to spend on on food and and other necessities, which are getting more expensive. Yeah. So just if that continues, you might wind up not being able to pay your bills. If you have a medical problem, if you have, uh, you know, your roof needs to be patched, you don't have cash reserves to to handle those sorts of things. So maybe you take, maybe you put everything on a credit card. Now you have more monthly debt. So it, it's, that's what worries me. And then, you know, you and I haven't talked about the dreaded R word yet, but, but the, the reality is that the Federal Reserve is almost, 
almost inevitably going to push us into a recession, uh, not because they want to or they're mean or there's a conspiracy. Uh, but but the fact of the matter is, if you look at the last 11 cycles where it looked like there was going to be high inflation or there was high inflation, the Fed acted preemptively three of those times before the inflation took off. And in all three of those times, we had a soft landing. Everything worked out well. There were another eight times where inflation had already taken off and the Fed came in to correct the inflation. And in eight out of eight tries, we wound up with a recession. So uh, Fannie Mae's chief economist just last week uh, called for a recession probably in the second half of next year. Uh, he's looking at it being a mild recession. Deutsche Bank seems to be going back and forth between mild recession and severe recession. But one thing all recessions have in common is job loss. So if we're if we're looking at a, a traditional typical recession, which might happen next year, uh, you, you could start to see job loss. If you see job loss, you're going to see delinquencies. And if you see delinquencies, inevitably, you'll see some foreclosure activity. So what's, I don't what's, see a wave of foreclosure this year. But in fact, I don't think we'll get back to normal levels of foreclosures until the end of this year, beginning of next year. But if we do have a recession next year, we, we could see some fallout from that. So, okay. Yeah. So we, we are at record few delinquencies right now. Yes, we are. And because everybody has equity, everybody has a cheap mortgage, everybody has a job. Like yep. what conditions would you not pay your mortgage? <laughs> like, you know, the, uh, the very only real weird scenarios that, that, um, you know, we'd, we'd have, get behind on mortgages right now. Mike, you'd be surprised how many of the loans that are either delinquent or in foreclosure are actually from the Great Recession era. These are bad loans that have been bad loans for a decade. Um, and and we, we've been reporting uh, through through our, our Adam database, a higher rate of foreclosure activity over the last, last quarter, the, the first three months of the year. I mean, you know, 132% quarter over, uh, quarterly increase compared to a year ago, but it, it's off you know, foreclosures that were running at 25% of normal levels. Right. So it's just going to take us, but, but the, the point is that the loans we're seeing under foreclosure right now, we're in foreclosure or we're 120 days past due before the pandemic. They, so they were loans that should have been in foreclosure two years ago. They are, they are chronic uh, non-payer type yeah. folks. Yeah. I, I, I have a friend who is in that boat and it's wild <laughs> and it's in court, out of court, pay some shuffle things around. Like, that's like it's kind of part of the trade. It's like the yep. you know it's it's wild, but uh, it, you know there was, a, there was a guy there was a guy in Long Island who was evicted a few months ago, who had been in the foreclosure process for twenty three years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it's crazy. It's crazy. So so that's interesting. So the <clears throat> foreclosures are climbing, but really these are these are like there's not it's not like uh, people who are somehow pandemic impacted these are pre-pandemic yeah. uh, things and and we're getting through a long backlog and we're still running at half of the normal level of foreclosure activity yeah. so it's just you're going to see the headlines but but you know people that are watching the podcast should keep in mind that you know again those increases are coming off remarkably low levels remarkably. so so then uh unemployment to delinquency to foreclosure what's the lag time uh, that's a good question, and it'll probably be a little longer than in previous cycles. So uh, normally, uh, unemployment to delinquency can be anywhere from 60 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, and then delinquency to foreclosure, because of the regulations that were put in place during the Great Recession and because servicers are being extraordinarily cautious about putting people in foreclosure right now, um, is probably you know, another 60 to 90 days after that delinquency kicks in. Um, so you're, you're probably talking about six months before, you know, between job loss and entering foreclosure. Yeah. And then the length of time you're in foreclosure varies wildly. If you're in Texas or Georgia, you may be in a two month process, you know, uh, start to finish in states like New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Florida, it's over a thousand days. So you could be in for, in the process for, for three years or more. 
Right. The um, the ju- ju- judicial states are, uh, and there's this likely backlog in there, so we probably have... Uh, there, there, there's a backlog, not just of foreclosure cases. You're, you're absolutely right. The the courts are backed up because of the pandemic. Um, so they're, they're just kind of working through that backlog, and they're not going to be anxious to get, you know, foreclosures processed foreclosure. quickly just to be nice. So in some ways, we could see that, um, you know, we, like... Uh, we have to rate hike to calm inflation. It triggers a recession, but that recession then is job loss in the second half of 2023. Right. And then it's it's a good six months from then before we start seeing active inventory increase. So it's like 2024, assuming all these things happen. Yeah, and if it is a mild recession, um, you know, keep in mind right now, there's one and a half jobs available for every person looking for work. Yeah. And we, I think we had a record jobs month that was just reported this morning. So I, so I, th- those numbers may even be conservative. So the, the real question is how bad is the jobs fallout? If, if we do have a recession next year, if you lose your job, is there another job waiting for you? Um, or can you get another job fairly quickly? Or does the government step in and do something unprecedented again? Because you know, now we've seen that we, we really can interject and prevent a lot of, of unnecessary foreclosures. Or is the housing market still going gangbusters? Uh, and and as, as the inventory is coming to market, we don't even notice because people are gobbling it up. One of the big differences this time. So anybody who's an investor or a real estate professional, this is important, an important consideration. There was a glut of inventory during the Great Recession. When 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 the wheels came off the bus, there was over a 12-month supply of homes available for sale. In a healthy market, we're looking at about six months. Uh, as, as you've been reporting regularly for the last couple of years, we're down probably at, at two months or less uh, nationally right now. Um, if, if that inventory level uh, continues to be low, um, people continue to look for properties to buy. If, if you're looking to buy a home in foreclosure, last cycle, you didn't buy it um, in, during the foreclosure. You probably didn't even buy it at the auction because the, the pricing was off. You waited for the bank to repossess the property and then ultimately bring it back to market at a discount. That's not the situation this time. Um, 90% of borrowers in foreclosure actually have positive equity, which is un- unbelievable. 25 Four percent of them have more than fifty percent equity. There's wow. no reason for them to lose a house to foreclosure. They, at the very least, should be able to sell it at a significant profit. So we believe that most of these properties are going to be sold before the auction. And and my friends in the auction industry tell me that whatever is going to sale at the courthouse or in a sheriff sale, uh, the sell through rate right now is between sixty five and seventy percent, which is double the normal rate. So people are going to those auctions and buying because that's all the inventory they can find. So there's almost nothing going back to the banks. So if you're going to buy this cycle, you need to be earlier in the process, probably working with those distressed homeowners. And that creates a win-win because they don't lose everything to a foreclosure. They don't lose all that equity to ongoing fees and fines. And you bring inventory to the market or or find a property you can buy. So let me me make sure I got this right. So 90% of the homes that are in foreclosure right now have positive yep. equity. That's correct. Wild. So then if you're an investor, you are, uh, it's likely never going to go all the way through the process where the bank owns it and then auctions it because at some point, somebody's going to go, oh, I'm, I, I got to get out of this thing and then they will sell it. And it's not yeah, even we, a short sale. It's like, no, it's, it's a regular right. it's, sale. It's a, it's a traditional equity sale. You might be able to get it for a little below market value because you do have a distressed owner who's on the clock. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's like like I said, when you when you start breaking out these numbers, some some of the numbers are just mind boggling. But but the problem for that homeowner with fifty percent equity is they can't tap into the equity to get out of default, out of delinquency. Uh, because no no bank, no lender will give them a loan because they're currently unemployed or and they're, they're, they've missed a bunch of payments. They, so they don't pay their them. loan, right? Yeah, I'm not going to give you another loan on your equity. Yeah. So we, we do see some shared equity players moving into this space uh, who, who will, will actually 
create products that are geared specifically toward working with those kind of distressed borrowers. I was, I was unemployed, missed six months of payments. I'm now in foreclosure, but I have 50% equity and I found a new job. Um, well, for a share of the equity in your house, um, and, and you know some some profit margin, uh, they will let you tap into that equity to pay down your debt, and you kind of restart. So it's yeah. it's interesting that we're seeing these kind of fintech companies pop up and, and fill that void. So there there may even be some cases where those houses don't have to be sold, where the the homeowner can can tap into the equity and save the house. Those equity sharing um, applications have always have always sort of escaped me of when they're really a, a good deal. Most of the time, yeah. they're high fees and, and things that, and when you can sell really quickly or you can get a HELOC, like that's that's uh, those seem the traditional ways seem like better deals. But this is an interesting application where yeah. I can't get a loan. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity, um, and like so. We can get that out via an equity sharing agreement rather than a loan agreement. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is I've, I've seen a couple of these examples. There are companies like Unison and Unlock, um, and and the Unlock people in particular. I've seen a couple of presentations. Uh, there aren't this unlike a loan. You're not making payments, so that's the other benefit of this. You're tapping into the equity. You pay down your debt, uh, and you're not making payments. You don't do, don't owe anything until the end of the term. Now, the, the flip side of that, you have to go in with your eyes open, is if you continue to accrue equity, they get a share of that too. So your 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 ultimate profit from the, the, the sale of your house is going to be diminished a little bit because of that share. But if you're in a situation right now where you're going to lose everything, you know, it's a, it's an interesting It's an interesting option. Yeah. In, in most cases, it's like, People are buying their homes and it's the only investment they have anyway. So I don't want to give up that equity. That's the only thing I've got. But in the case where like, that's the way to get it, that where I need that capital uh, for whatever, you know, happened like that, that uh, that's a really fascinating uh, view of it. You well, also mentioned the, the, the other question I get about people selling their house while they're in foreclosure is, and you won't be surprised with this one is where are they going to live? Yeah. Um you know, there's virtually nothing available for sale. Apartment vacancy rates are about two percent across the country. So the other, the other potential benefit to tapping into your equity and staying where you are is you don't have to worry about that. Um, and and if you like where you live, your kids in a good school, so forth and so on. You know that that's the other benefit to that kind of approach. I'm I am not shilling those services. I'm just we're having a conversation. We're having a conversation about when those might be useful. That's great. I appreciate that very much. You know, you also mentioned uh, government programs and, and, of course, during the pandemic, unprecedented support for homeowners. Yep. Um, it, uh, you know, one of one of my bull cases or arguments for real estate uh, is that all of our policy in the U.S. tax policy, you know, all of the things is about protecting the homeowner, um, which works actually to the detriment of the buyer the people who don't own yet yep. uh, because it keeps people in their homes it you know it it prevents them from s- selling their homes when they you know they hit a time when if you can't afford the home maybe it's a good thing to sell it yep. uh, but but they support that uh, it seems unlikely that that overall policy uh, approach will change so it seems like the government's into, supporting homeowners um and so i see it as a uh is like it seems unlikely that uh we're going to shift and and all of a sudden shift uh policy to support people who don't own homes uh yet and like which would do th- which sounds bad because that means like granny gets kicked out of her house because her tax payments went up or you know those kinds of things it sounds really mean Uh, And and so it seems unlikely that that policy will will change. What do you think about uh, a government policy and maybe even like over the next uh, few years, implications for the market, for what we're talking about, anything there? Is there is there anything that we should be noticing? Any trends? So just what you talk about, Granny, is is a concern of mine. We, We just published our annual property tax report uh, and and taxes nationally uh, went up 1.7% year over year, property taxes. Um, 
home prices during the same period of time, according to our calculations, went up 17%. So I, I believe there is a, 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 a trailing tax increase that homeowners need to be on the lookout for. And, and I am really concerned about markets like Boise and St. George's, Utah, and to a lesser extent, Phoenix. But Boise last year saw price increases of 45% uh, in home sales. And, and as you mentioned, a lot of that was people selling their house in Silicon Valley, taking the cash and, and overpaying uh, you know, 20, 30% over list uh, because they could and because it was half of what they just collected on selling the, the house in San Jose and they don't care. Um, but what happens to granny who's on a fixed income, who's, uh, who's proper, whose housing cost is predominantly that property tax bill? Are they gonna go up 45%? Uh, and, and what does that mean for, for people currently living in the market? So the, the, the truth is the tax assessments go up irregularly across the country. Uh, we're kind of isolated, insulated from that in, in California, you and I, because of, of Prop 13. So. It's it's you know we we don't really see the real world, um, but but I you know whether it's an annual increase or every couple of years, there could be sticker shock for homeowners across the country when that happens. And there sure sure could could sure could be the uh, the Prop 13 is such a a crazy double edged sword. It's yeah. it is like I talk about it as the worst tax law ever, uh, you know because because your property taxes in California don't go up, you know you uh you. It's like rent control. It, it is rent control for homeowners in the in the state of California. And the result of rent control is that because I, my payments are artificially low, I don't ever move, and therefore I never give. I, there's there's a shortage, and so and there's a shortage, a chronic shortage of homes for sale in California because of Prop 13, and uh, and you know, and it's it's a fascinating implication uh, because you know, to get rid of Prop 13, you know, there's all kinds of other implications of the negative of that. So property taxes are super low. Therefore, the schools are starved. Therefore, uh, the the communities, cities don't want to build more residential. They want to build commercial because commercial taxes will increase. So now you have an even more shortage created. Like you have this, this crazy dynamic because of Prop 13. Um, but granny doesn't get kicked out of her house. Yes. And and it was is all in service of Granny not getting kicked out of her house. Now, in California, in some of the California markets in San Jose, Granny's got a three million dollar house with two point nine million dollars of equity because she bought in nineteen seventy eight. Yeah, and and is and literally has has uh, like and is paying you know a few hundred dollars a year in property taxes on a three million dollar house. Well, it'll, it's not really a few hundred dollars a year. Um, <laughs> it's 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 a few thousand dollars a year, but 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 it, it certainly hasn't kept pace. You're absolutely right. right, and and it is something people look at, and I think they looked at it even more closely uh, with the tax reforms a couple of years ago that capped your 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 deductions for your salt uh, taxes. Um, so so. You know, it, it's one thing to own, and, and I'd say million dollar house because people outside of California, that looks like a big house. In California, that's a fixer upper. Um, but you know, you have that million dollar house, and you're no longer able to write off your state and local taxes uh, beyond, I guess, ten thousand dollars a year. So it, it's it's a really weird dynamic in California. It's probably. It's almost as weird in some other high tax, high price states like New York and New Jersey. Not quite as weird because they don't have Prop 13. Um, but we actually ventured off the question you were originally asking, which is on policy. And but but it, th this conversation actually is going to make one of the points I was I was going to offer, which is that most of the policy initiatives, most of the policy decisions that will affect housing, won't be coming from the federal government. They're going to be coming from state and local governments. Um, because you know you can have all the initiatives you want from Washington, but if the uh, the if the, the the if Peoria County uh, doesn't want to implement certain housing initiatives, they don't get initiated. They get zoned out, uh, and and so a lot of this comes down to what your local city council is is deciding they're going to do. Um, I do know that the the current administration is resolute uh, about two things. Uh, one is about 
uh, the need to increase affordable housing. So it's really good that somebody's finally paying attention and trying to come up with, with ways to affect change in, in affordable housing. Um, and by the way, they have broadened that definition. This is really meaningful from owner-occupant to owner-occupant and renter, uh, because it turns out that asking rent prices have gone up 14% year over year too. Um, so it, it's it's good to see that there's at least a lot of of hard work and thought going into how do we fix that. The other is they're really, really dedicated to increasing the rate of black home ownership, uh, which if you look at various ethnic groups and their home ownership rates, uh, black home ownership candidly has been lagging behind every other, every other group. Um, if you look at the Asian American Pacific Islander uh, home ownership rates, they're actually higher than average. Um, white home ownership is higher than average. Uh, Hispanic home ownership is still below average, but it's been going up consistently for the last five or six years. Uh, but 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 black home ownership rates have lagged behind, and, and the government's uh, trying to figure out ways to affect that. Um, but but it's it's there there are limits to what they can do in a local market basis because you know the just the difference the the, the states' rights the the local county uh, laws the federal government just simply can't overrule those so. They're they're trying to come up with some combination of carrot and stick programs uh, to entice entice communities to move into that, create more high density housing units in in, in transportation hubs. Um, if you look at the top twenty five cities across the country in terms of population, you'll find that almost all of them are zoned uh, very very heavily for single family homes, um, which which again makes it it tough to have high density units and, and affordable housing. So. There's a long climb to get out of this before before we see that work. One of the things uh, somebody suggested in a, a, a meeting I was just recently at, I thought was fascinating. The, the, the CFPB, uh, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, put lending rules in place to prevent some of the excesses we had that led to the Great Recession. That was necessary, and it's worked pretty well. But one of the things they did was cap how much a loan officer can make on a loan. Um, and, and and what percentage they can make on a loan. And what that's done is disincented loan officers and lenders from writing low dollar value mortgages. So if, if you can write a loan for a $70,000 house or a $700,000 house and your profit and your commission is going to come on a percentage of the loan, you're not going to write a lot of $70,000 loans. Um, so, you know, a, a kind of common sense solution to making affordable loans more available would be to undo the cap on, on profit and commission to incent lenders to write more of those low dollar value loans. And there's a need for that because the, the lenders who used to do those were community banks, local community banks. And unfortunately, the CFPB's guidelines inadvertently wipe them out of the lending market for loans. The cost of regulatory compliance for the CFPB's rules is so extraordinary that only the largest lenders can afford the cost. So all the local banks went out. They just stopped issuing mortgages. Um, so it's funny that this organization that was created to prevent too big to fail uh, has basically made it, you know, too small to survive uh, in this in this industry. And so, you know, as, as Ronald Reagan once said, famously, uh, the scariest words in the English language are, "I'm from the government, and I'm here to help." I love that you got a Reagan quote in. That's nice, nice work. It's good Southern California, uh, Ray, suburban Southern Orange County, Reagan Republican. That's great. Um, the uh, uh, the the so those policies and there's a, a few i was talking with dan green uh from homebuyer.com mm -hmm. on on the podcast uh, a couple months ago actually and he was talking about how uh as uh as as uh um, you know fanny and freddie um rate you as a lender and if you're the lens your loans you're doing are they go delinquent then like you you're a lower rated lender uh and as a result, yeah. the lending standards have been higher, and yeah. therefore it's harder for for lower credit first time buyers to buy. Yeah. Um, but as um, as rates go up, um, it looks like that's one of the things that's happening is that um, is is that the the lending standards can loosen a little bit and actually make it more possible 
for uh, some, you know, lower credit buyers to to have uh, action and like have ability to buy. That's a um, wonderful theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the reality is that for the last decade, the biggest lenders, the biggest retail shops, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, City, Chase, um, that that group have exclusively written two kinds of loans. They, they've written conventional loans, 30-year fixed rate loans that fit, that check every box in the CFPB's QM loan rule book. Uh, so you had to be a pretty much perfect borrower in order to qualify for one of those loans. They, they're not taking on any risk, whether it's regulatory risk, loan default risk, headline risk, none of it. The other loans they've issued are jumbo loans to high net worth individuals uh, in many cases at better rates than they were giving the conventional loans, which is very unusual, but they wanted those borrowers for other banking services. Um, and so they use those almost as a loss leader to get those people in. But if, if you had a, a less than perfect FICO score, credit profile, job history, you weren't getting a loan from those people. Um, the, 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 the paradox in the industry, you, you touched on the first part, which is that if you're a lender selling your loans, loans are being underwritten by Fannie or Freddie, um, they will ding you and your records if, if you have a, a high delinquency rate, a high default rate. They're also going to ding you if you don't expand your, your, your loan, your credit box to, to work with underserved communities. So this is this is the ultimate push me pull you llama uh, of of the of the lending industry. One of the things nobody talks about that kind of precipitated the Great Recession is that lenders were under enormous political pressure to go out and write loans to people they didn't think qualified for loans, and then they were accused of being predatory because they did that because um, it's always easy to beat up the banker. Um, so it, it's a real, real paradox for lenders. Uh, they're, they're under pressure to, you know, not redline anybody, um, but but also not to allow any loans to go delinquent or into default, which is just the, the other thing that I, the reason I don't think we're going to see the credit box loosen too much is the CFPB announced about a week ago that they are now going to regulate non-bank lenders the same way they regulate the retail banks. That's bad news for anybody who's not a really, really well qualified borrower because the the place you could get loans was from non bank lenders. And these are not all tiny little undercapitalized shops. That's you know Quicken and, and Rocket Mortgage fall into the category of, of non bank lender. Loan Depot falls into the category of non bank lender. So all of a sudden, these folks are going to be under extraordinary regulatory oversight. Uh, at, at risk of getting enormous fines if if they if they do anything that that you know they is viewed as being you know too risky um, or or against the interest of, of that borrower. So I think unfortunately, and and I love Dan Green and 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 uh, he and I are both Philadelphia sports team fans, so we have that in common. We're long suffering long suffering fools, um, but I, I I think. Just that announcement last week is going to cause the opposite to happen of what normally would have happened. Normally, we would start to see the credit box expand a little bit as interest rates go up. But I, I think that CFPB announcement is going to have a little bit of a chilling effect uh, on that non-bank lending community. And if you look at who's writing the most mortgages these days, I, I think the last time I saw it, six or seven out of the top 10 lenders were non-bank lenders. So I, I think that's going to be a, a bit of a challenge. Interesting. Okay. So that could be yet another thing that slows our demand yep. in the second half of the year. Yep. That's really interesting. Okay. Well, uh, let's, let's, uh, we've been talking, you and I could talk for hours on this topic, yes. but let's, let's wrap up. What I like to do is I like to ask my guests, uh, you know, we've been in such a hot market for such a long time. Let's look forward a few years. And what what are the risks that uh, the train goes off the tracks? What are the, you know, what, what do you see in the future? Um, and, and are there risks that we haven't talked about or that like that um, aren't commonly discussed that that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, that's a great question. Wish you'd warn me about this one in advance. Um, I don't see endemic risk in in the in housing fundamentals. 
Um, I, I I think there there could be a risk of a bubble if prices don't slow down, but I, I think prices are going to plateau this year uh, or at worst early next year, just because of, of market conditions. So I, I don't think we go into a bubble that bursts. Um, the, the, the cohort right after the millennials, the Gen Z group, appears to be forming households earlier than millennials did. So I, I don't see a huge drop off in demand that way as we go forward. Uh, there is a there there's a potential demand, but we're four or five years away from it of the builders overbuilding because they are starting to. I mean, we're seeing really strong housing start and permit numbers right now, but they've been very disciplined. I mean, they they underbuilt for a decade, so it's going to take them at least another four or five years at current rates before overbuilding became even even a thought. Um, so, and and I don't think there's anything sociologically or psychologically that's going to change the mindset of most Americans uh, about the, the the desire for home ownership. The, the biggest disproven nonsense of the last 50 years was probably the, you know, the, the meme that millennials weren't going to want to be homeowners. All the research always said they would. They were just getting to it later. Um, and, and there were a whole, whole bunch of good reasons for that. Um, so if I'm going to look at anything in the next three, four years that could upset the apple cart, it'd probably be a, a, an unexpectedly severe downturn in the U.S. economy. Um, it was funny, I was, I was speaking at, a, at an event, uh, oddly enough, on, on September 11th, 2019. And I was talking about the fact that the housing market was just on fire, that the U.S. economy was hitting on all cylinders. Um, jobless rates were at 50-year lows, uh, and, and it, it was working across the board. A highest rate of Black employment, of Hispanic employment, most women ever in the workforce, all systems were go. And, and I closed my remarks by saying, unless there's some sort of global catastrophe, I don't see anything derailing the U.S. housing market. Uh, apparently, the universe was listening, or, or, or at least somebody in Wuhan province was listening. Um, and you could almost hear them crunching into a bat when I said that. Um, but but the and I probably just offended somebody. I apologize for that. And me, but, but yeah, yeah. But but that's what I. I mean, you know, absent something that we really aren't looking at right now, or or absent a significant downturn in the U.S. economy, which is a possibility. The U.S. economy is is you know has been kind of in a bull run for the last decade as well. Um, the the housing fundamentals should continue to be strong and. Uh, and so I, I, I hate to be Pollyannish, but absent one of those two things happening, I don't see a, a huge, huge downturn anytime soon. All right, Rick, that's uh, outstanding. Thank you so much for your time today. The conversation is terrific. I've got a bunch of notes on, uh, you know, neat things that we can call out. Uh, really interesting insights. I, I uh, appreciate so much the time. My pleasure. And, and please don't write anything down because that gives you proof I was wrong next year. <laughs> That's right. Turns out when you make uh, predictions in uh, this kind of environment, nobody pays attention that you're wrong. <laughs> so it's okay. You can predict whatever you like. Good um, for me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Uh, I, I avoided making predictions for years because I, I wanted to be right. But now I just like, just here's what I know, man. This is what I know. And this is what like what we can see. And here's what it looks like from here. Uh, and that's that's all we can do is, is you, you follow the numbers and uh, and interpret them the best you can. The best you can. All right. Uh, thanks. All right, everybody. That's the Top of Mind podcast for this week. This is Rick Sharga, my guest from Adam Data and Realty Track. Um, as always, you can find everything you need about your real estate data and about Altos Research at altosresearch.com. You can get these videos uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, as well as our weekly market data videos on Mondays on the YouTube channel. And Rick, where can people follow you? Social, where's the best place social media wise to can connect with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn pretty regularly. And you just uh, look, look for my name, Rick, Rick Sharga. Sharga. And uh, happy to, if you, if you do ask to, to connect with me on LinkedIn, just mention Mike's podcast. So I know where, you came from because I get a lot of really, really interesting invitations to connect on LinkedIn and I yeah. don't do them all anymore. Yes. 
I'm with you. Okay, so make sure you say Mike's podcast or Top of Mind or Mike from Altos Research, something like that. All right, everybody. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, Back next week. Thanks for listening to Top of Mind. See you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. 